This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Welcome to 2013. How much fun podcasting Covell, I don't know, over 100 podcasts in 2012. Started late January 2012 and over 100 podcasts. Monologues and interviews. And I don't necessarily have a technique for how this has unfolded. It's just been the way it's happened. So I leave February for Asia. I don't know how many countries I'm going to be in. It is an absolute, uh, it's a ton. Uh, I'm going to be everywhere. I'm speaking for a bank in uh, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore. There will probably be other events as well. I say this now and I will say it again. I will be doing one-on-one private events with serious investors and traders who want to really get behind the scenes and get there faster. So we're talking Japan, Korea, China, Thailand, Singapore, Bali, uh, Vietnam, I believe. So those are just some of the countries I'm going to be in, but that would be, those would be great places. If you want to sit down with me one-on-one and if you're serious, drop me an email. It's real simple to reach me. My first name at my last name.com. Michael at Covell.com. So jumping into this year, I'm inspired by an article. I'm inspired by this article that was in the Financial Times called Cerebral Circuitry. So the title says, researchers are focusing on whether gadgets are changing how our brains work as regards empathy and human interaction. Well, I think that's a no-brainer if you think about how many of us are addicted to iPhones and Facebook and, frankly, all this other stuff that, as far as I can tell, isn't making our lives any better. It sure as heck isn't making anyone's trading any better. Having all this instant information does not make your trading any better. It's absolutely nonsensical to think that. Anyways, I want to read some from this article to establish the tone of this podcast and where I'm going to go. So the article goes on to say, many new technologies begin with such virtuous goals of making the world a better place and its citizens better people, but many come with hidden costs that take time to service. Now that mainstream internet sites such as Google, Facebook, Amazon are all in close reach with a few touches of the smartphone in your pocket, the human side effects of being constantly connected are starting to emerge. And the article goes on to talk about that there's a growing concern that the emotional and empathetic pathways are being eroded by all this screen time. Uh, duh. You know, a lot of people think that Facebook friends are real friends. Some of them might be, but I'll bet you what? I'll bet you you met those real friends before Facebook ever was invented. It's very difficult. I mean, I've seen it happen in my case a few times to get close with people on Facebook, you know, really engaged people. And it's happened, but it's not the normal world. So there's this guy named Jaron Lanier, and he's a uh, big Silicon Valley technologist, and he says, we've been designing a paradise for people with Asperger's syndrome. Well, that that about sums it up, right? The article goes on, our ability to pay attention and focus is also being taxed. Most studies show that the human brain is not equipped to handle multiple streams of information at once, but we sit for many hours in front of multiple screens, flitting back and forth between various windows. A study that was recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that people who had become practiced at chronic media multitasking were worse at filtering out irrelevant distractions and at switching between tasks than people who spent less time on gadgets. I mean, I think we all know this deep down, but no one wants to really talk about it, right? The article continues, and I'm abbreviating here. It's kind of a longer article. You can take a peek at the whole thing. But the article goes on. It says, a Stanford study found that university students prefer to text a classmate down the hall in their dorm rather than knock on the door and talk in person because texting is less risky and less awkward. Uh, yeah, no doubt about that. I mean, I never would have met anybody in the trend following space by sending letters. 
I had to go find FaceTime. I, not, I don't mean FaceTime like Apple's FaceTime. I had to find FaceTime, the old kind of FaceTime where you go actually get in front of people. So this article continues, but it just basically makes the point that uh, it's, it's all not really doing much. All these screen time and all these gadgets and all these connections we think we have, they're not necessarily helping us. Now, let me get specific into my world. They're definitely not helping uh, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be a trader. And I, how do all these devices and all, how does all this information flow possibly help you if you want to be a trader? How? I mean, if you know something about trend following trading, you already know that the price of the market you're going to trade is the most important factor. So all this extraneous stuff you know, is just frankly taking away from life. So there's a couple other little nuggets here I want to kind of tie into that foundation. You know, the foundation that I'm establishing with that article uh, from the Financial Times is just that there's a kind of a scattershot, scattered brain mentality out there. And I think a lot of people actually think this is progress. They think this is the way to get ahead and all this information flow is going to make you money. The reality is just the opposite. It's not going to. Now, let me give another example, I think, of how things are, are going sideways and how people are maybe not thinking for themselves. And maybe if you, like me, believe some of the passages that I just read, that some people think getting ahead is to apply for an online application for a job. So instead of really being creative to go make something happen, to make some money, maybe you apply online to get a job or you apply online at some university. And it's easy breezy. You just apply. That's, that's how you think the world goes. Well, here's a great example of that. So Delta recently received 22,000 applications for about 300 flight attendant jobs. And so it basically works out to, a, to an acceptance ratio of 1.3%. Harvard, to get into Harvard, for the people who apply, the acceptance rate is 5.9%. In other words, 4.5 times easier to enter Harvard than to get a job at Delta as a flight attendant. Now think about that for a second. Like, why would, it, why would everybody be fixated and focused on simply trying to only get a flight attendant job? Why not go the extra mile and say, wow, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. I'm going to become a trend following trader. I'm going to, I'm going to see, and we're, we're being conditioned, being conditioned to not even think about what choices are. That was why I read some of that first article to begin with. You really have to think about what kind of choices are out there beyond what you're being fed? Now, you might say, Mike, what is this? Why is this all related to trend following trading? You can't approach trend following trading with a, you know, your head all in the clouds, lost in uh, a typical dreamlike state of the gadget guru who's sitting there with, you know, disfigured thumbs from texting so much. You have to think for yourself. So all I'm really trying to do with reading some of these articles is to outline a think for yourself mentality, a critical thinking mentality. So you can go ahead and clear your brain to get to the point to where you can make the decision, oh, I'm going to become an entrepreneur. Oh, I'm going to become a trend following trader. See, I see these examples out there and it, they just stand out to me like sore thumbs. You see, you know, this Delta flight attendants or the gadgets, you know, taking over our brains. These articles just stand out. They're like, wow, this is the reason that trend following wins. It wins because of this very essence of what's going on. This people lulled into thinking that all these ways they're doing it, you know, apply to get a job at Delta as a flight attendant. You know, just keep texting gadgets and having, you know, Facebook friend requests and all this stuff somehow or another is going to get them ahead. But it doesn't. It just doesn't. So those examples are just to, just to push your critical thinking, to push your insight, to look at the world a little bit different. So let me give a couple examples that have hit my desk, four things that essentially have hit my desk related to trading recently. And just the misinterpretations of perhaps trend following 
the misinterpretations of my work. And I think these are good. So I had a, I had a group recently contact me about doing a speaking gig in uh, Beijing. And I read through their most recent email and you could kind of tell that the guy that was writing me probably didn't know so much about what I was doing, but he said something to the effect. He said, well, you know, we've read some of our, your reviews, uh, in Chinese and, um, and they mentioned my turtle trader book and they said, well, you know, we, we think the book is too theoretical. So if we, if we have you to speak, or if we have you to teach, can you be more practical for us? And it, you know, I, I chuckle, I chuckle inside because I, I say to myself, gosh, chapter five of my turtle trader book are, it's how the turtles were taught to trade. It's as practical as it comes, right? But the guy that was writing me probably had not read the book. Uh, maybe he had read a few reviews. And like the article that I read at the very beginning, you know, this, this article where we're, let me read the title again cerebral circuitry he had not bothered to do the heavy lifting he had not bothered to read the chapter himself so all he was going off was some review somewhere for all intents and purposes could have been made up by some anonymous made-up character i mean that's the hard part today how do you distinguish between reality and unreality how do you distinguish between reality and unreality? And let me interject something about that point right there before I read. I have three more of these little market issues related to trading that I think are that are good educational pieces. But this is from this little excerpt I'm about to read is from Teller of Penn and Teller fame. And they're at the Rio in Las Vegas. I don't know why I'm promoting them, but I am promoting them. I like them. So Teller says, the most important decision anyone makes in any situation is where do I put the dividing line between what's in my head and what's out there? Where does make-believe leave off and reality begin? That's the first job your intellect needs to do before you can act in the real world. If you can't distinguish reality from make-believe, if you're at a stoplight and you're not sure whether the bus that's coming toward your car is real or only in your head, you're in big trouble. There aren't many circumstances where the intellectual distinction isn't Critical, end quote. And so I thought of that article as the guy that was writing me to come speak in Beijing. And he really doesn't even have the ability to know whether or not my Turtle Trader book is practical or theoretical. He probably doesn't even know what the definition of practical or theoretical in trend following trading is to begin with. And doesn't begin to know for sure how important the theoretical is. Look, the practical is important, and I deliver the practical to people. But if you don't have the theoretical down, you're toast. Anyways, continuing. This is this second excerpt. I had someone write me, and they said that, uh, and they, they were saying that I said this, and I don't remember saying this, but that everybody should have a system for their own personality. You know, I've heard people say that, and people I respect have that view. But I don't know how that makes a lot of sense to me because when I look at examples of how trend following trading has succeeded over the decades, I often see these groups where people were trained, so to speak. You look at the turtles. They were given rules, taught. Boom, boom. They went and were successful. I look at other traders that had close associations, AHL out of London, you know, including David Harding. I look at Ment and Larry Height. I look at Ken Tropin being involved with John Henry at one point in time. I look at all these associations and I say, well, I can have whatever personality I want to have, but if I want to be a trend-following trader, here is how it is done. This is what you have to do. Now, you might say, well, it has to fit my personality. What does that mean? And I, I, I said that to somebody recently. They said, well, somebody might want a short-term trade or they might want a swing trade. I said, well, what does that mean? Swing trading, short-term trading, Elliott wave trading. You know, the thing that I did when I wrote my books is I, I was very fortunate. I had all this fantastic performance data that proved trend-following trading, this fantastic assortment of data 
I don't know where that exists for these other styles of trading. Look, you don't have to be a trend following trader. It, does, it won't phase me. But if you're going to be a trend following trader, you decide to be a trend following trader, period. And to say that trend following trading doesn't fit your personality, so you're going to go do swing trading, well, that's nonsensical. That doesn't make any sense. I, I, if somebody can send me, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 disclosure documents that show long-term track records of swing trading, whatever that means, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying I'd love to see it. I haven't seen it. Continuing to my third market example in this podcast. So someone writes me, this says, hi, Michael. I met you at this Tim Sykes conference. I'm interested to know more about tr your trend following strategies. Are they applicable in today's choppy market environment? And can we apply them to options, uh, even though there's time decay uh, working against us? Well, first off, time decay is not an issue with trend following because you really want to trade leaps options. You can't be trading things that expire in a month or two. That's ridiculous. That's not that's a whole different issue. So you you can't be just trading regular options. Forget it. Um, choppy markets. So I find it interesting. So in, in this in this lady was very nice, but she said today's choppy market environment. Today's choppy market environment. How long does that go? How long does quote choppy? And how are we defining choppy? And how does the choppy market stop tomorrow? Does it continue tomorrow? What, what, so, you know, when I told her, I said, you know, you can never predict when a market will be choppy or not. You need a strategy for all market conditions and trend following fits the bill. You're not going to make money during the chop, but you're going to lose less. And sometimes losing less is much more important than trying to make money. You can only take what the market gives you. Right? But see, and this is why I read some of the cerebral circuitry piece to begin with. And I talked about the, the teller piece, the teller excerpt that I read. Thinking critically. I see these questions and I say to myself, gosh, somebody's asking me about today's choppy markets. Like choppy goes on forever. Like choppy could change tomorrow. And if you don't have a strategy to adapt to whatever condition you think the market is in, and however you define the word choppy, and should you know choppy is a subjective term. You've got to define it with a number. It just doesn't make a lot of sense to think like that. So hopefully she understood my example when I wrote her back, and maybe hopefully she'll hear this too. And I'm not picking on her. I thought it was a it was a good example, a good question. So a friend of mine. This is my fourth little market example today. So Jim Rohrbach uh, writes some great commentary, and he put a piece out recently that I caught in late December, and it said. He was listening to a radio show and uh, the show, I guess it was a friend of his, and the host of the show said, the stock market is always right. And Jim says, I love that. Yes, the market is always right. And Jim goes on to say, often we hear people saying the market is going to go up or go down and they place their investment decisions with what they think the market is going to do. For example, the choppy thing we just talked about. Then when the market doesn't do what they think it should do, they try to tell us that the market is wrong. They don't admit that they're wrong. The market does what it wants to do, and it's always right. We may not agree what the market is doing at any point in time, but it's futile to say the market is wrong or to invest opposite the market. If the trend of the market is up, that is the correct trend, and we need to go with it. If the trend turns down, we should get out and not try to rationalize that the market should not be going down. Since the market is going down, and since the market is always right, we should get out, end quote. And I said, nice, Jim. I mean, you know, that's a great way to think about it. And so I'm reading all these examples today to come back to that point where Jim is so eloquent and blunt about it. The market is right. If the market is going up, you're long. If the market is going down, you're short. Now, you need precise rules to deal with that. Can the market get choppy? Absolutely, the market can get choppy. You need rules for dealing with that, too. For example, that's what I help clients to understand. The rules that get you long, the rules that get you short, the rules that help you to lose less money when the market's choppy. But see, the whole idea of this podcast that I wanted you to think about was the idea of critical thinking. That when you see excerpts in the paper and you can see something like this cerebral circuitry article and you realize, wow, you know, you read that article and you're like, well, how's that useful to trend following? 
you know it's useful to tramp on because you know the vast majority of people are, are acting just like this. And that when the markets do start to move, boom, 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 these are the kinds of people that are fixated to the matrix. They're not going to know what to do. They're not going to have any strategy. They're going to panic. They're going to be the sheep that I put in my film. That's why these articles are useful. That's why it's useful to think about them. It's not useful to think about them and get anxiety or angst or anything like that. It's just useful to realize, wow, who am I up against? Because the market's a game and you're up against a lot of people in that game. And the vast majority of them are truly, they've taken the blue pill and they're affixed to the matrix and they've got their little device in their hand and their thumbs are starting to take on a different shape because they've been texting so much. That's who you're up against. And once again, I, you know, I'm not trying to make a value judgment or say those people are necessarily bad. I'm just pointing out that if you want to make more money than the average person, you can't do what the average person does. You got to do something else. That's what I love about trend following. Trend following is the something else. It's the something different. So reading all that stuff, I'm going to kind of wrap up with a quote that I saw from Alan Watts. And uh, this is great. And Alan, the, the Buddhist Zen spiritual teacher who is no longer with us, he composed this excerpt that I'm about to read in 1951. He says, quote, The more one studies attempted solutions to problems in politics, in economics, in art, philosophy, and religion, the more one has the impression of extremely gifted people wearing out their ingenuity at the impossible and futile task of trying to get the water of life into neat and permanent packages, end quote. 1951, there is trend following summed up beautifully. Summed up beautifully. So many people think that they can use all this texting, use all this information, all this data flow to somehow or another get a jump ahead on the markets. Somehow or another, they're going to they're get everything figured out in advance. And a lot of them are very smart. But you know, you only live one time. You only live one time. And so it's up to you. You have to make a decision. Do guys like Alan Watts, do guys like Bill Dunn, Richard Dennis, Jerry Parker, Bill Eckhart, Keith Campbell, Ken Tropin, David Harding, Larry Height, Richard Donchian, Jesse Livermore, do the words that have come from these men over the years, the wisdom that's come from these men over the years, does it have grounding? Does it make sense? Is it timeless? You don't want to be sitting there guessing. You want to have a strategy and you want to have a plan that can do well in all market environments at all times. And so I'm, I'm starting to think the more that I read from Alan Watts that he was just a secret trend following trader. He got the idea of flow. And you can't predict the flow. You don't know when it's going to flow one way or the other. But he got it. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash, or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.